picture is blacker than ever. Good evening. President Gorbachev has purged the Soviet leadership of three more of his personal problems tonight, and he's promoted his own reformers. Out from the Politburo go two of the old guard, the Ukrainian party chief, Mr. Vladimir Sherbitsky, a survivor until tonight from the Brezhnev era. If the Ukraine is unhappy, Mr. Gorbachev may not survive. Also out, General Viktor Chebrikov, former head of the KGB, and Mr. Viktor Mikonov, the Agricultural Secretary, the farms have failed again. The special meeting of the Communist Party Central Committee also endorsed plans for radical change in the National Republic. They include the very unhappy Baltic states. Tonight, as news of the Politburo reshuffle broke, it brought to a dramatic end a party meeting that many had seen as a watershed. Later, at the end of this two-day party plenum, the Central Committee members emerged. The news of the changes were first revealed to ITN. This member told us they had reached the very heart of the Politburo. It was only later that the Soviet public were told. A special television news flash confirming that three members had been retired from the Politburo. Earlier at today's session of the Central Committee meeting, Gorbachev spoke of the need for the unity of the party in the face of unprecedented difficulties. This strength in the party, its political dominance, has been underlined by these changes. But Gorbachev's such a move was dictated by the pace of his reform drive in the Soviet Union and the need to revitalize the leadership in the coming years. One of the three retired was Vladimir Shevitsky, the party boss of Ukraine and the sole political survivor from the Brezhnev era. The others were Viktor Nikonov, here on the right, a key figure in agriculture, and Viktor Chebrakov, a former boss of the KGB. All were seen as conservatives within the party. An embarrassed Gennady Gerasimov, the government spokesman, was forced to cancel a press conference after a five-hour wait by journalists, an indication of the political sensitivity of tonight's event. The scale of the Politburo changes reflects the daunting task facing the party in this country. With ethnic divisions and a serious economic crisis, Gorbachev believes only a new leadership can offer real hope for the future. Robert Moore News at 10, Moscow. And now the latest from Robert Moore. Robert, the chief conservative, Mr. Ligachev, is still in position. Is that a sign of Mr. Gorbachev's weakness? Well, it's very difficult to determine that. It's no question that this is the biggest reshuffle since Gorbachev came to power. And I think he's finally discredited the last of the Brezhnevites in political life in the Soviet Union. But the Politburo remains a complex mi mix of politics. And I would be reluctant to say that he's either significantly won all the votes of the Politburo now. It remains a complex structure all the same. But the new men who have come in are his own men. Indeed they are. I think now he's really moulded political life largely around him. And of course, one of the most significant elements of the plenum was the party congress, which has now been brought forward. That will allow him to bring his own men in at all levels of the, of the party throughout the country, including at the central committee level. Thank you, Robert. Alistair. Britain is, after all, to be prosecuted by Brussels for not meeting European Commission standards on drinking water. The Environment Secretary, Mr Chris Patton, who personally made the government's case against prosecution two days ago, says he's astonished. Labour and conservationists say it's good news for British consumers. The timing of all this is deeply embarrassing for the government, not least because Mr Patton spent yesterday and the day before personally pleading Britain's case with the EEC Commissioner. But the Commissioner, anxious to prove his muscle, was not to be moved. This was our last weapon had unfortunately to be uh, used, but I think that uh, it will contribute to what is important for environment and for people's health. Mr. Patton's discomfiture is all the worse since he reckoned he'd actually arranged to get a postponement of the prosecution. I'm uh, disappointed. I think it's a very, very unfair decision. I think it's largely inexplicable in view of the discussions I've had with the Commissioner this week. Uh, we've got the biggest compliance programme for the European Community Directive in Europe. We're investing millions, indeed billions of pounds, in raising the quality of our water. Uh, we're complying as rapidly as we can. The Commission has at no stage suggested how we could do things more rapidly. The fact that this has all happened as the flotation of the soon-to-be-privatised water companies approaches is only adding to Mr. Patton's blushes. 
so is the fact that Labour chose today to launch a huge onslaught against the government's whole green strategy. Tonight, Labour called the EEC move on water good news for the consumer and bad news for the government. In Birmingham earlier, Mr Kinnock had launched an even wider attack. You don't get much in the way of environmental sensitivity from a centralising, water and electricity privatising, market-mad government that makes nonsense of the planning laws and which prides itself on dodging European environmental standards. They are not going to be the source of a green transformation. It so happens that just up the road from Birmingham and Mr Kinnock today, the Green Party was gathering in Wolverhampton for its annual conference. The news from Brussels handed them a propaganda gift. The government has been saying for some time that it's going to clean up its act. Now the pressure is there as the party of law and order. They must obviously welcome the law being taken into use against them. Tonight, government sources are claiming that by the time the case actually comes up in two or three years, Britain will be so far along the road towards full compliance that the case itself will be meaningless. They're therefore calling the Brussels prosecution a sideshow. Michael Brunson, News at 10 in the West Midlands. The intensive use of nitrate fertilisers by farmers is thought to be the source of most nitrate pollution in rivers. Already the government is encouraging farmers in 12 experimental areas to use less or not to grow crops that require nitrate. Farmers put nitrates in the soil to boost growth. Most of the nitrates stay in the soil around the roots, but when the crop is harvested and the land ploughed, nitrates are released and filter into the underground water table. From there, they enter rivers and so drinking water. The worst affected areas are in the Midlands and in East Anglia. The quickest way of, of achieving the levels required is by water treatment or blending high nitrate water with low nitrate water. Changing farming takes a long time for the effects to feed through into water supply. The government's one and a half billion pound programme for treatment to remove nitrates from water may now have to be accelerated. And there are other challenges ahead from the group whose complaint started the European action. Friends of the Earth have also complained about breaches of the standard for pesticides, for lead, for aluminium and other things as well. And our complaints will lead to further action by the Commission against the British government. The process has started. The government is picking up. It's just deserved. Today's reversal may not be the last headache the government faces in Brussels. The French airline UTA is almost certain that a bomb blew its DC-10 out of the sky over the Sahara. 170 people were killed, at least four of them were British. There have been two phone calls claiming that a bomb was put on board by Islamic Jihad, the Iranian-backed terrorist group. The plane was en route from Brazzaville to Paris via Chad's capital in Janina. Radio contact was lost as the plane crossed the Chad-Niger border and wreckage was eventually seen in a remote area north of Lake Chad. Early this morning, anxious relatives waiting at the airport in Paris were given news they did not want to hear. A French military plane out searching for the DC-10 had spotted wreckage scattered over 70 square miles on the border between Chad and Niger. Flight 772 went missing soon after takeoff. It's the third disaster involving a DC-10 this year, but the pilots have not reported problems and officials are saying it was a terrorist attack. I would say if there had been a technical problem for which I can't see a reason, there would have been enough time to allow the crew to give a warning. Later at the UTA headquarters, it emerged that in the last 24 hours, the airline had received two calls from a man claiming to be a member of the Iranian-backed Islamic Jihad. The airline say they are not taking the call seriously, but Islamic Jihad has been behind this kind of operation before. It's certainly true that Islamic Jihad has bitterly attacked France for its policies in the Lebanon, and, for example, made threats when the French government moved ships towards the Lebanese coast. But uh, at the same time, uh, an aircraft flying on this route in Africa is not the most obvious target. French troop planes carrying doctors and medical supplies have now arrived at the scene of the wreckage. Aircraft investigators are expected to bring back proof that this was a terrorist attack. Jane Faircastle, News at 10, Paris. In Northern Ireland, another leaked document from the security forces has come to light. It's the sixth document to be made public. It was sent to four different people, along with the death threats from the banned loyalist paramilitaries, the Ulster Freedom Fighters. The Irish Prime Minister, Mr. Hawley, made his second statement on the leaks in two days. He said, it's an appalling picture. The situation cannot be tolerated.
President Bush has declared a state of emergency in the U.S. Virgin Islands after the onslaught of Hurricane Hugo. And the U.S. Coast Guard has landed on St. Croix to restore order after reports of widespread looting from frightened tourists. Turning towards the United States across the Caribbean, advancing at 12 miles an hour with winds of more than 100 miles an hour. It's left behind at least 25 people dead and a trail of destruction. On the British island of Montserrat, there's almost total devastation. On St. Croix, law and order has virtually collapsed, and even the police have been looting shops. And in Puerto Rico, Hugo's winds have left 10,000 people homeless. Hugo's now on course to come ashore between Florida and North Carolina. Montserrat has been devastated. There's hardly a building intact. There's hardly a family which hasn't lost almost everything. Montserrat doesn't normally get hurricanes, and therefore people are inclined to take it rather lightly. But this time we got the word across. They did batten down. But because the storm is so extreme that even taking all the precautions that were reasonable, we still lost, as you can see, about 95% of our, of our buildings. Hurricane Hugo tore up everything in its path. Rains followed. The hospital was flooded. The injured are now treated outside. Eight islanders died when Hugo hit their homes. They're buried in a storm-swept cemetery. Offshore, the Royal Navy frigate Alacrity. Its helicopter crew search for the dead, circling what's left of Montserrat's exclusive homes. The whole island has been, as the locals term, trashed uh, by the force of the hurricane. And uh, we are here trying to uh, repair roofs and restore electrical power and telephones as well. by one of 200 British tourists who fled Antigua today. Two islanders died here. A British couple escaped from this bedroom when a wall collapsed. Montserrat is now desperate for the 10 tons of supplies the RAF is preparing to land and for the vehicles, boats and helicopters being organized by the British Embassy in Washington. This is the worst crisis in the island's recent history. Bill Neely, News at 10, Montserrat. Mrs. Thatcher rebuked and warned the Japanese about trade barriers today. They said how wonderful she is, but has anything changed? A report next. Stuff. They like it over here, but what are they like to work for? And in Kenya, a pathologist insists Julie Ward was murdered. That in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Okay, okay. The bike's crude oil. The bike's coconut oil. The bike's coconut oil. Hmm. How's all of it? Some bike. And increase my mortgage payments from that way. If you like to stay and control the garage buildings, buy enough West flexible mortgage. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Sell sugar. Sell soya beans. Yeah, sell hot pizzas. Uh-oh. Increase my mortgage payment from that way. It lets you change your monthly payments according to your circumstances. Sell everything. Gold, I want gold. Mortgage payments in that way. Would you like tea or coffee? Good idea. I'll buy them both. Linear Network flexible mortgage for the ups and downs of life. Again, surveillance. No, sir. Number 21 shows ambitious tendencies. Follow him. Mrs. Thatcher told Japanese businessmen in Tokyo today that they must open their markets or risk a trade war. She had two hours of talk with the Japanese Prime Minister, Mr. Toshiki Kaisu, about trade and about China and Hong Kong. The talks were said to be friendly. Mrs. Thatcher was sampling Japanese high technology for herself today, travelling in a bullet train capable of 150 miles an hour past Mount Fuji to the south of Tokyo. 
And on to the Fujitsu Electronics Factory. Her message to the Japanese was that if they wished to continue their economic miracle, which has produced such technology, trade restrictions had to go. A barrier is a barrier, whether you call it a cultural difference, a tradition, or anything else. That rebuke was delivered straight to a lunch of Japanese businessmen, and she warned too that unless restrictions were lifted, the entire world trade system was in danger. A solution must be, and I believe will be found, not just for the sake of Britain and Japan, but because so much else, indeed the future prosperity of the free world, depends upon it. The reaction of the Prime Minister's audience was, in the circumstances, surprisingly warm. That speech was wonderful. Uh, please uh, forgive me to express my personal impression. I met her some 10, 11 years ago. Since then, she becomes faster and more attractive, and uh, her speeches become more and more persuasive. Later, at the Prime Minister's residence, she met another apparent fan, Prime Minister Kaifu, and she took the same message to him. The talks were friendly, but the Japanese seemed far from accepting the urgency of the Prime Minister's words. And as Mrs. Thatcher walked barefoot to a traditional dinner with her host, a solution to the trade dispute seemed a long way off. So even though Mrs. Thatcher and her host remain on the best of terms, her message to them was a blunt one. It is that unless the Japanese change their habits, there could be a worldwide trade war. Peter Allen, News at 10, Tokyo. Mike Jonesy believes he's contributing to the Japanese economic miracle in Britain. As he drives into the Panasonic television factory in Cardiff, his thoughts turn to the tough production target he and his team have to meet. Every day is a challenge. What's on my mind is the fact that would be daily plans. I'm trying to put the family in the back of my mind, physically, and look towards the daily production target. Habitually early for his 7.45 start, he's responsible for two production lines. His workers are expected to produce a TV set every 90 minutes, each spending 22 seconds on their allotted task. Every worker is trained to be ambidextrous to achieve maximum speed. Mike believes the success of the company is the result of teamwork, top to bottom, Japanese style. And the stock is advantages. The way they've um, created teamwork. I think it all hinges on that. I think a lot of people in the company will tell you exactly the same thing. Because it's true. It's the, it's the teamwork and the atmosphere they generate. Meal breaks are strictly regulated. A siren sounds and Mike leads his staff off immediately to a canteen for a 40-minute lunch break. There, senior managers and shop floor workers eat side by side. Then it's straight back to work and time for Mike to brief his foreman. They share his enthusiasm for the Japanese experience. You always get to go to do job security here, and we're treated very well by the Japanese staff. The challenge is to get the production figures, the targets to set you. Um, I found in British companies you didn't have targets to achieve, so at the end of the day it was quite difficult to measure how well you were doing. Before the day's out, the Japanese managing director visits Mike to check those target figures. Pay is performance related, and today he's satisfied. So is Mike, his team having produced the 3,000 TVs needed to hit the target. And he even has the satisfaction of walking out past the fruits of his labour. Penny Marshall, News at 10, Cardiff. Here, the Transport Secretary, Mr. Cecil Parkinson, admitted today that the construction costs for the Channel Tunnel Rail Link are soaring. The link will now cost nearly three times the original estimate of £1.2 million. Pounds. On one side of the Channel today, the French were unveiling their Channel trains, which will ply the journey from Paris to London at nearly 200 miles an hour. Here, as BR unveiled their latest high-speed train for the East Coast, there were fresh doubts about who would pay for the link to the Channel Tunnel. Ever since the route was announced, locals have fought to revise it. Rerouted tunnels under London and longer tunnels in Kent have pushed up the cost significantly. Originally, the whole line was estimated at £1.2 billion. Now that would build just over a third of it. The revised total to finish the project, over £3 billion. And compensation payments to local residents are well above original estimates. There are still thousands of cases being fought. Chris Williams is challenging BR's refusal to pay compensation. His flat currently overlooks a quiet suburban line, but soon the green field beyond will be the mouth of the London Tunnel. I've put the house on the market. It has been on the market since April. I haven't had a single person come to look around, and I haven't had any help from British Line. BR says after five months on the market, he hasn't yet proved his flat is unsellable. 
If they do eventually pay, it'll be yet another addition to the cost of the link. The government's own act forbids them from paying for the tunnel, but many analysts think Transport Secretary Cecil Parkinson might have to find a way of subsidising the link. I don't want to infer uh, by expressing a view about whether the government should or should not infer them. The ground rules have been clearly laid out. The parties know them. They think the project is worthwhile. They're working to deal with difficulties. And with stiff competition from ferries and airlines, the passengers themselves may be reluctant to pick up the tab for the cost of making the tunnel link more environmentally friendly. The American airline Pan Am has been fined £400,000 for breaches in security at Heathrow and Frankfurt airports after the Lockerbie bombing last year. The American Federal Aviation Authority imposed the fine because of poor security during the screening of passengers and their baggage before boarding planes at the two airports. Mr. F.W. de Klerk today called for a totally new South Africa as he was sworn in as state president. He pledged to remove race discrimination, but he said the radicals have no role in the peace process. He did not announce any further moves toward the release of Nelson Mandela. In a Pretoria church, I, Frederick Willem de Klerk, do swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. There was more ceremony than substance to the inauguration, but while President de Klerk made no dramatic announcements, he pledged again to implement real reform, and he appealed to South Africa to be given a chance. My call to the international community is take note of what is happening in South Africa. There is a determination amongst millions of South Africans to negotiate fair and peaceful solutions. Use your influence constructively to help us attain that goal. But out on the range in South Africa's heartland, die-hard conservatives like Jan Selye, who are now a minority of a minority, reacted to President de Klerk's message with bitter resentment. The white people is getting poorer and poorer day by day. And I think that the future for the whites in this country is as dark as, as night. And Mr. de Klerk's speech touched the life in the black township. There's nothing to send that to church as compared to the others. And one of the main things that we expected him to talk about was maybe the release of Nelson Mandela, but he said nothing, absolutely nothing about it. President de Klerk has asked for time. The anti-apartheid opposition has given him six months to turn words into action. Kevin Dunn, News at 10, South Africa. In Kenya, a Home Office pathologist has told the inquest into the death of the British tourist Julie Ward that she was definitely murdered. Professor Austin Gresham said the Kenyan evidence had been deliberately altered. The evidence Professor Gresham gave to the inquest completely refutes the claim by the Kenyan authorities that Julie Ward fell victim to wild animals. One of the world's leading pathologists from Cambridge University, the professor used these diagrams of the injuries to Julie's skull to prove that she was decapitated from behind by one single swipe with a sharp instrument used with considerable force. She was uh, dismembered and the pieces were burned and that, if that isn't a strong indication of murder, I don't know what it is. The professor also condemned attempts to alter the report of the police pathologist's first post-mortem on Julie. He concluded she was murdered. His report has been crudely changed to make it look like the injuries were caused by wild animals. And we would regard it as, 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 as an amazingly bad bit of medical practice. John Ward's lonely vigil outside the court ended today when he was called to give evidence for the first time. He told the inquest how he had to arrange the aerial search for his daughter because the police had failed to act, and how he first learned the awful truth about his daughter. John Ward described to the court how he found a lock of hair in the fire. He picked it up and realised for the first time that the scattered remains around him were his daughter, Julie. David Schroeder, News at 10, in Nairobi. Here, Michael Knighton, the property developer trying to buy Manchester United Football Club, has confirmed that the takeover will go ahead. Just six hours before the deadline expired for United's new owner to find the money, Mr Knighton emerged exhausted but evidently relieved that fresh finance had been secured. Needless to say, I'm absolutely delighted. I, I, I have to say that. And I must pay tribute to every single person that's been involved in this. They've been magnificent. And I'm very 
very grateful. Uh, but just to uh, obviously see what we've done in four days as opposed to the three months that I've been I think before it's been magnificent. Ever since the football crazy property tycoon appeared as a surprise purchaser of United a month ago, there's been intense press speculation about where the money was coming from. Records showed he owned St David's private school in Huddersfield, but there was little other information. When his original partners pulled out, the United deal had looked in jeopardy. Clearly, with only three working days to go, uh, before one really had to uh, make a sensible decision, uh, then uh, there wasn't a great trust to that. Yeah, really Not in my opinion. As United arrived for tonight's game, its owner insisted he was the sole purchaser. Its former owner said he was completely happy with the deal. My understanding is that we would, would uh, just be informed that the deal has gone through. Are you quite happy with the outcome of yeah. it? Yeah. And as far as you know, there's no more hiccups to come. As far as I know, no. Mr. Knighton arrived in time to see the second half of tonight's game. His main worry now to get a good return on the immense investment in new players. Mark Webster, News at 10, Manchester United. Soccer, three games in Scotland and England tonight are on News at 10, are on ITV after News at 10. Otherwise, Charlton 3, Hereford 1, 4th Division Exeter 3, 2nd Division Blackburn without their goalkeeper nil. It was before Halifax nil. Norwich 1, 3rd Division Rotherham 1, Forest 1, 3rd Division Huddersfield 1, QPR 2, Stockport 1. Wednesday nil, 4th Division Aldershot nil. Spurs 1 after 74 minutes, South End nil. West Brom 1, Bradford 3, York nil, Southampton 1. And the main points again, Mr Gorbachev has sacked three members of his ruling Politburo and the European Commission has announced it will take Britain to court over our drinking water standards. And that's it tonight. Good night. <laughs>
report published today. Fairmile Hospital has already closed 50 beds because it can't get enough staff. Michael Burwood reports. This is the only psychiatric hospital for the huge population around Reading, but it's in crisis. Its facilities are out of date and more and more staff are leaving. We were only allowed to film part of the Victorian building, which, according to a health service report, needs a lot of money spending on it to maintain the service to patients. The report says that members of West Berkshire Health Authority should take a close interest in Fairmile Hospital and its standards to make sure they don't get any worse between now and the time it finally closes down. There's still no definite date for closure, and the staff shortage is now desperate. 30 have left in recent months, forcing management to make cuts. They're extremely concerned. I mean, uh, in itself, the staff are the lifeblood of the, the hospital. Um, and whatever our new vision of the service and the length of time that it might take to get new services on the ground, gradually the hospital is shutting itself as staff leave. So time is rapidly running out for Fairmile Hospital. The health authorities say all they can do is speed up plans for moving patients out into the community. Police have released dramatic pictures of an armed robbery in Sussex. A man threatened staff with a handgun at a building society in Haywood Street. The raider escaped with more than £2,000. Firemen have been fighting a blaze in a flat at Cocknor in Portsmouth. It broke out above a shop in Tangier Road. The flat was badly damaged, but no one was hurt. Football and in the Littlewoods Cup, Southampton beat York City 1-0. Aldershot drew 0-0 against Sheffield Wednesday. And highlights of the Portsmouth match can be seen at 11.20 tonight. For now, a look at the weather with Carl Tyler. Good evening. Well, dry and clear again tonight, but there's a little bit more moisture in the air, so I think some of this patches around that dawn period. Temperature-wise, a mild night, only falling to 11, that's a lower 50 Fahrenheit. Now, the chart coming in tomorrow that shows some changes. The low pressure's gone. We've still got the old front lying to the north of us. We're not going to see that until late on Friday. The ice bars are coming apart, so light winds should change to go along with the sunshine. Tomorrow morning, then, that mist going quite quickly. We've got a good deal of sunshine right the way through the morning. Into the afternoon, well, a little bit of fair weather cloud building up, but still, long sunny spells. Your best temperatures, 24, mid-70s. So to summarise then, it's going to be very warm, with a good deal of sunshine, and only light wind. Well, that's all from the TVS News in tonight. There'll be more from us at 9.55 tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>